What I wanted to do first is to sort of start off um, with homelessness and, and, and sort of the experience of homelessness. We, we often come to the situation with a lot of assumptions and a lot of ideas um, that aren't necessarily representative of the reality of the experience for people. I think a lot of us, when we see something like this, what we immediately think of is rather positive memories of things like sleepovers or camping trips or maybe visits to the library. But for a lot of people, this is this is the reality of homelessness. Uh, you know, on the left hand side, this is sort of a pretty good example of uh, of couch surfing. So this might be sort of, you know, a, a, a trans youth that has been kicked out of their household, doesn't have a place to stay, doesn't feel safe in the shelter system, and is therefore accessing, uh, you know, someone's, uh, you know, a friend's, uh, a friend's couch or, or, or bed and can't do that for any extended period of time. Uh, you know, a lot of us have seen the media images of the encampments that we're seeing in, in, in many cities and especially in Hamilton. And so a tent can really be a home for someone. And when it comes to libraries, we might think about sort of pleasant times, you know, spent reading with our children. But for a lot of people, libraries are vital resource centers. They're a place to cool down in the summer. They might be the only place where you can access internet. Uh, and and when it comes to you know this this nice picture of of a natural setting, this might be the only place that you feel safe, tucking away from prying eyes. And so this might be a place where you pitch that tent. And the stats really are you know a lot of us can struggle to understand the scope and scale of this. And what I want to talk about today is the different kinds of homelessness and what that means for our community. And the stats really sort of come on a national level. You know, we see they're, they're, it's pretty large. It's a pretty large problem. We see at least 235,000 uh, Canadians experiencing homelessness every single year. And this really can be sort of understood in a couple of different ways. You know, the, uh, you know, the bulk of people, about 41% are staying in emergency shelters. And this is separated often by gender. So some of this is sort of wi uh, often women fleeing domestic abuse. Uh, and, they, and they're going to women's specific shelters. Uh, and we've certainly seen an uptick, or an uptick of this during the pandemic um, because uh, for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about a little bit later. But as you can see here, you know, the, it's actually the minority that are unsheltered. So the people that we see in the encampments, the people that we see sleeping on the street are actually represent a very small minority, less than 10% of the total amount of people that are experiencing homelessness. And I wanna pause on this, on this language piece because it's really important to think about this as an experience. So, so something that people are experiencing rather than, you know, so, than a category, a noun, something that a person is. So we don't, we don't like to talk about someone, you know, someone is homeless, they are experiencing homelessness. Uh, because it's a condition often, and for the vast majority of people, it's often transitional. So it represents a moment in their lives that for a variety of reasons, they're, they're sort of in between places. And so it's really important to break this down into this kind of chronic, episodic, and transitionally homeless, so you can understand the kinds of supports that people need, but also to sort of reveal the extent of the issue and the problem for a lot of people. Again, we tend to think and conjure in our heads that sort of experience of homelessness as being, you know, the person sleeping on the street, when again, the vast majority is people experiencing various levels of being unhoused or transitionally uh, um, uh, housed. And this can happen for a variety of reasons. It might be, again, someone fleeing domestic abuse. It might be someone who uh, is experiencing rent eviction. It might be someone who cannot afford the, the housing prices in that particular community. And this is something certainly that we're seeing in Halton and Hamilton in terms of the cost of living and the general vacancy rates. They really are, it is really very difficult for people to afford them uh, on, either, uh, on either minimum wage or on, on some sort of support into there. So we like to break it down to this chronic, episodic and transitional. And again, the stats, just so you sort of see, so every year, a lot of municipalities go through some, so a, a counting process where they try to get a point, a point, uh, you know, a point count of, uh, of how many people are experiencing it. And it really sort of helps determine where some of those supports are going to go. 
And you can see here again that, this, so this was conducted in 2018 and it's conducted every few years to get a sort of snapshot. Halton and Hamilton both did participate in this and it gives you a sense of both where people are staying, the, the, and so you see again here, there's quite a few people in emergency and domestic violence shelters, uh, quite a few people in, in transitional programs, and relatively small percentage of people that are actually unsheltered, who are sleeping rough, who are, who are experiencing the homelessness that we, again, typically think about. And you can see again here too, the breakdown by demographics, that the vast majority are adults, 25 to 49, but there is a fair percentage of un unaccompanied youth. Uh, and people with dependents. So that sort of image, I think, that a lot of us have of this sort of maybe older man who's experiencing homelessness is actually not a reflection of reality. And you can see here, too, another sort of, I'd like to sort of uh, point you towards this sort of dip that happens between adults to older adults. And that is really driven by the fact that uh, there's a guaranteed in income supplement that kicks in once you get old age uh, pension that really drastically increases the rates, um, uh, the, basically the rate of support that people have and allows them actually to afford market rent uh, in a lot of communities. So you actually see a great drop into it. So again, this is really driven by that ability to access that affordable sh uh, shelter. And that, that tension between visible and hidden homelessness is really important, especially in our context in Hamilton and Halton. Because in Hamilton, again, we tend to see it a little bit more, but in Halton, we often tend to think of it as not a problem that we have here. And so in addition to the kind of visibly homeless, that number that I showed you earlier, there's almost a million Canadians that are, that are sort of defined as hidden homeless. So these are people that are in transition, that are moving from place to place, that may be temporarily rent evicted, and, and, and this is a very stressful thing for people to undergo. It can really lead to a lot of impossible choices. So when it comes to things like domestic violence, people have to often have to choose, do I stay with my abuser or do I risk sort of leaving my home and not having an opportunity to really sort of settle into anywhere at this point because access to affordable housing is extremely difficult. The wait list is around seven years in the region here. So it's not, it's not like you can sort of turn around and find a place easily. And in both communities, again, vacancy rates are extremely low. So it leads to a lot of impossible choices for people. And to sort of, you know, lean into this a little bit, and this, these are, again, some of the numbers from the point in town, the, the most recent point in time count. Notice here that you know, again, we tend to think of Hamilton as having more of a homeless problem, but the numbers in Halton are actually higher per 100,000 persons. So when you look at the rate per population, Halton actually has a higher percentage of, of people experiencing homelessness than Hamilton does, even though it is technically more visible. And this has resulted in a lot of sort of, uh, sort of um, public outcry. It has resulted in a lot of sort of discussions. You know, you've probably seen a lot of things in the news right now around defund the police. This is right now being associated with, uh, with, the, with the homelessness issue, in particular in Hamilton, where people are saying we need to spend more on affordable housing. The city of Hamilton, um, in particular, has really uh, pushed something called the 20,000 Homes Initiative. So they're really looking at opportunities to provide significantly more capacity because, as I said, there's about a seven-year wait list when it comes down to, uh, to, to, how, to how many, um, you know, to, to be able to access affordable housing. And in Halton, we're actually starting to see some of the some encampments popping up because people are also during COVID not feeling safe in the shelters. They feel, you know, and the numbers are that are coming out. Um, I just saw an article in CBC yesterday that was pu pushed out that homeless people are about five times more likely to get COVID and to have complications of COVID. So there's a real sort of um, rationality behind this sort of this this sort of choice that a lot of people are saying is I'd rather not be in a shelter right now. I'd rather be out in in the fresh air in a tent. And so there's a lot of tension here that's happening as a result of, uh, of these things and the sort of inadequacy of the shelter system. And so because of this and because, you know, that, you know, if you, if you think back to that image of the public library, a lot of people experiencing homelessness really rely on those kind of public resources. They rely on the Tim Hortons bathroom. They rely on the public library. They rely on a lot of these sort of services out there, even public bathrooms that have been closed as a result of COVID. 
and and they rely on drop-in and day programming that have been reduced that provide things like food that provide warmth that provide provide cooling in the summer all of these things have really had to shift as a result of this and a lot of the service providers that were providing these these services have had to adjust and shift as a result of covid in order to be able to really ramp up and, and deal with things like increased costs of cleaning, PPE, giving PPE to clients, all of these kinds of things. And this is, again, having a huge ripple effect on those people experiencing homelessness right now and that were before COVID, but it's also pushing a lot of people that were really marginal and on the edge. You know, all of us have heard the sort of horrible statistics of people who are one paycheck away, right, from who don't have anything left, that if something happens, and unfortunately, a lot of people are experiencing that right now. So COVID has really exacerbated that kind of precarity uh, penalty that people pay for being that, you know, that close to the margin, they don't have any savings. And so I think 2021 in particular, we're going to see a real lag effect as things catch up, as CERB payments, you know, those have been, those have been pulled back. We still, a lot of people still don't have access to sick time uh, during this. And we've seen, again, this increase in domestic violence and really sort of a, even more pressure on the housing market as a result of COVID. And all of these things are gonna ripple through 2021 and are gonna cause a really sort of, I think, long-term negative trend. This is the time to put our foot on the gas. We have to accelerate anything that we get to help us support and pivot and really make sure that 2021 isn't the year that the safety net has bigger gaps in it.